Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies Pulmonary Embolism. Today we're going to talk a little bit about how pulmonary embolism occurs and how to identify and manage it in your patients. Pulmonary embolism can come from one of a couple different ways. It can be intrinsic or it can be extrinsic. Intrinsic means that it's forming within the body. Extrinsic means that it's coming from outside. Usually when we talk about a pulmonary embolism, we're talking about a blood clot. So if it's caused by fat molecules all lumping together, we call it a fat, fat embolism. If it is a air that is being introduced from outside, we call it an air embolism. So typically if we're saying pulmonary embolism, we're talking about it being a blood clot. But pulmonary embolism really is kind of a broad term that could incorporate all of these different components. About 10 to 30 percent of pulmonary emboli are correctly diagnosed. How do we know that? If 10 to 30 percent are correctly diagnosed, how do we know that they aren't all correctly diagnosed? Well, we find the rest of them on autopsy. That's not exactly our best diagnostic test. So we would prefer to find these at a time and catch more of them so our patients can be treated. About 30 to 50 percent of patients with a VTE, that's a venous thromboembolism, will have a silent pulmonary embolism. So depending upon the size of this clot will depend upon the amount of symptoms that our patient has and of course their underlying pulmonary condition. So if the patient has really good pulmonary condition, maybe they're a runner and all that other kind of stuff, the patient might likely have a silent PE as opposed to having one that has lots of symptoms. About 90% of patients with a pulmonary embolism though will have a venous thromboembolism. Now you see this is good information because we can be looking for those venous thromboemboli then as a good indication that our patient could be having a PE. The other thing we'll look at is Virchow's triad of risk factors. Dr. Virchow identified these risk factors many years ago, venous stasis, endothelial injury, and alterations in coagulation. The combination of these three things greatly increases the risk that your patient's going to develop either and or a venous thromboembolism and or a pulmonary embolism. So let's talk about each one of those just for a moment. Venous stasis means that the blood is not moving properly. So if our patient has shock, for example, and they have a low perfusion state, they're going to have venous stasis. Blood is not moving the way it normally should. If your patient has vascular issues, maybe the patient has got some uh, varicose veins in their legs, etc. That also is going to increase venous stasis. Anytime the venous blood is not moving in a nice way back to the heart like it should be, we could have venous stasis and it could be predisposing the patient to develop a clot. Endothelial injury is the second risk factor. The endothelium is the inside lining of the blood vessels and when that becomes injured and it can become injured for a variety of reasons, trauma, surgery, and infections. Infections will cause an irritation to the inside lining of the blood vessel. This is one of the theories of how we develop atherosclerotic heart disease, is that sometime early in life, usually in our early 20s, we will have an infection of some sort, maybe a strep throat, for example, and that bacteria irritates the blood vessels and that sets them up with kind of a rough coating that allows our platelets and our lipids to start binding together and forming a atherosclerotic plaque, which eventually then turns into your acute coronary disease. Alteration in coagulation is our third risk factor. That means any situation that would alter our patient's ability to be able to have normal coagulation. Some of the situations we run into frequently that do this include surgery, trauma, and sepsis. In those situations, we have an increase in coagulation as a result of trying to clot off those invaders, in the case of sepsis, or clot off that area of injury, in the case of trauma and surgery, 
So in those situations where we have all three of these risk factors, our patient would be at high risk for developing a PE. So what happens with a pulmonary embolus is an embolus, and if we're talking about an embolus, we're talking about a moving clot, formed in the legs. It moves its way back up through the venous vasculature, keeping in mind the veins get bigger and bigger as they go back to the heart. So there's nothing to stop this embolus. The veins are getting bigger and bigger. The embolus is free floating now. It comes back, it goes through the right side of the heart. All those areas are large. It's got lots of room to move. And then it hits the pulmonary vasculature. It hits the pulmonary vasculature and the vessels get smaller. So then it gets stuck in the pulmonary vasculature. Now remember, this is a vascular event. It's not an event in the airways. For that reason, you might, and very likely will, not hear changes in breath sounds. Breath sounds are occurring in the airways. This is not a problem with the airway. This is a problem with the vasculature. So initially, we may not hear any changes in breath sounds, but our patient may be complaining of shortness of breath and may be complaining of chest pain because there's an area of the lung that is no longer being perfused. So the symptoms we most frequently see with a PE include, these are symptoms that were found from a series of studies they did in the 1980s, 1990s called the Pyoped studies. Dyspnea occurs most often. Pleuritic chest pain, that's chest pain that is sharp, localized, and worse on inspiration, and cough. So those are the three main symptoms we would see, followed by restlessness, apprehension, hemoptysis, and calf pain. I think the calf pain part is interesting since that's one of the symptoms that was frequently taught as a sign that the patient has VTE and has a pulmonary embolism. On physical exam, we expect to see tachypnea and tachycardia. Tachycardia may be your only presenting symptom in some of your patients, especially those patients in the ICU where they're on a ventilator. We're not going to see tachypnea necessarily, but we may start seeing that heart rate climb up. Now, if you think back to the picture we had previously of the heart, and that clot in the vasculature, the heart has to pump against that narrowed vasculature where that clot is, and that's going to put more back pressure on the heart. Heart's response will then be to increase the heart rate in order to try to maintain flow. So that's where we get the tachycardia from. Lastly, the third physical exam finding we may see are rowels or crackles as they may be called at your institution. About 51% of the time, we're going to hear those. Remember, again, those are breath sounds that sound like a very small bubbling sound or crackling sound at the end of inspiration. So they're usually soft. They usually start in the bases and work their way up. In this case, those rowels or crackles are going to be heard in the area where the clot has formed. In the area where the clot is formed, we're going to have a ventilation perfusion mismatch that is going to cause fluid to start moving into the alveolus eventually, and then we're going to start to develop those breath sounds. However, don't expect that right away. Patient, boom, starts complaining of chest pain, heart rate starts going up, probably still going to have clear lungs at that point. Hypocapnia, we're starting to blow off the CO2. Okay, remember CO2 diffuses across that alveolar capillary membrane 20 times better than oxygen does. So we're going to blow off that CO2, but at the same time, we can't move the oxygen across that membrane, and we end up with hypoxemia. Jugular venous distension because of the back pressure on the heart. Pulsus paradoxus, that's a situation where the patient's blood pressure changes with inspiration and expiration. And in this case, the reason for that is, is that when the patient inhales, there's more positive pressure in the chest. We have more back pressure against the heart from that clot, and there's going to be changes in the blood pressure. So if you're getting blood pressures that are all over the place, one time you took the blood pressure, it's 150 over 90. The next time you take it, it's 120 over 70. Understand that this could be a sign of pulsus paradoxus. If we have our patient in the ICU and they have an arterial line in place, it's a lot easier to see because you can actually watch the waveform go up and down on that arterial line. Diaphoresis is also possible. 
So how are we going to diagnose this? Well, there's a number of different things that can be done that give us some information. There really is not a diagnostic test we can do that says, hey, this patient has a PE, I can see it right there. Uh, maybe if we're using a CT scan, we can see the area, uh, but it's we really don't have this great diagnostic test. So we have to use a variety of different components together. The clinical characteristics of the patient. So that goes back to Virchow's triad of risk factors. Does the patient have Virchow's triad of risk factors? Does the patient have those signs and symptoms that are associated with PE from the Pyoped studies? Next we can look at D-dimer. D-dimer is a blood test that tells us whether or not the coagulation cascade has been activated. A positive D-dimer just means that the coagulation cascade has been activated. So obviously that's going to happen if we have a clot in the lung because the body's going to try and break it down and get rid of it. But we can also have a positive D-dimer if our patient has sepsis, has trauma, or has surgery. Those same risk factors that we had before, right? Well, they're stimulating clotting and therefore D-dimer is going to be elevated. However, if the D-dimer is negative, then that means we don't have a clot. So that's the real value of D-dimer. D-dimer can help us to rule out a PE. It does not help us much in ruling in a PE in a lot of our patient population. Well, then we can move around to the venogram. If your patient has a positive D-dimer and a positive venogram, so we're seeing a clot in the legs, chances are good that patient has a PE. The, in fact, the chance that that's going to be associated with a PE is about 80%. So it's a pretty good diagnostic combination there. Next we can move over to the VQ scan or the CT scan of the chest and we can take a look to see if we can see an area of the lung that is being affected. With a VQ scan, simply what they do is they take a scan of the perfusion and then they take a chest x-ray which shows us the ventilation and we simply put those on top of each other basically and look for a difference. Is there a difference in area of perfusion versus the area of ventilation? CT scan is going to show us some changes, maybe some swollen vasculature, and we could also see uh, possibly some changes that are occurring in the lung tissue itself, like some early interstitial edema, et cetera. So we may be able to find some of those pieces with a CT scan. Occasionally, if the clot is large enough, we may be able to see the clot on the CT scan as well. So our prompt action will be identification of the patient who could have a PE. So we want to be able to identify who has the PE and get them prompt action as soon as possible. So we're looking for Virchow's triad of risk factors. We're going through that secondary assessment of our diagnostic test and identifying our patient as having a PE. Maintain their oxygenation. And again, when we're talking about maintaining oxygenation, that doesn't mean we slap oxygen on everybody. It means that we want to make sure that the patient is able to saturate at least at 90%, maybe 92%. Assess and support hemodynamics. And remember that the back pressure is on the heart. The way that this is going to eventually lead to mortality would be because of that back pressure on the heart. So the hemodynamics are important because that is the component that's going to lead the patient to becoming unstable. Anticipate thrombolytics, especially if our patient is hemodynamically unstable. Ventilatory support may be necessary. Circulatory support may be necessary as well. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Emergencies, Pulmonary Embolism. This is part of our Nursing Emergencies program. Well, thanks for joining me today. Until next time, 